John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Now among those who went up with the worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Phil Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies and bears much fruit, those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what I should say, Father, save me from this hour. No, it is this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. If we all could bow our heads in prayer. Oh, gracious God, this Lent you have showed us more about who we really are. But because of who you are, what we have learned is not so much what has been, but what will be. And we have an inkling this is only the beginning. This is only a mere taste of what is to come. Oh, God, would you really make us able to live as if this truth were really true? Remind us of your infinite grace, your infinite compassion. Give us the courage to live for others as you have so courageously given your life for us. And Lord, today we ask you be with Pastor Bill as he gives us the word and we listen to the word about compassion. We give thanks for him giving of his time to help us during this time of Pastor Terry's renewal. Lord, be with Pastor Terry as she thinks of returning to this congregation. Continue to be with her as they try to find answers about her health. And Lord, be with this congregation, be with Epworth United Methodist Church, and continue to bless each and every person bless the work that goes on behind the scenes that sometimes we don't even know what's happening we have a finance committee a mission committee we have uh, coffee hours we have people who teach our children we have people who lead us in music lord continue to be with our congregation and let us continue to grow be with us during this holy week. It's in Christ's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, it is good to be back. Liked it so much, I think I'll come back next week. My favorite part of the service now is, is Jackie's children's moment, because I get to find out what I'm going to preach about. Because <laughs> she said, Bill's going to talk about the compassion of God, so I guess I better. Yeah. So let's just scrap everything I was going to say. I was going to talk about the judgment and condemnation of God, but now I've got to talk about the compassion. Oh, well. I have it on very good authority also this morning that if you would turn and face the camera, go ahead, go ahead, and wave. I have it on a very good authority that Pastor Terry's watching this morning, and that good authority would be the text I received that said, I'm watching you this morning. <laughs> Terry is a very good authority. So good morning, Terry. So how many of you are familiar with the American poet, John Godfrey Sachs? Look, my librarian spouse doesn't even know John. 
Well, he wrote a poem in the mid-19th century entitled The Blind Men and the Elephants. And this is what he writes. It was six men of Indistan to learning, to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each might by observation, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Ho, oh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp to me tis mighty clear. The wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake. I see, quoth him, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis mighty clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most, deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The six no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were very wrong. So often theologic wars, the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prat about an elephant none of them has ever seen. So what do we all know about people who are arguing back and forth, who rail in, I would say, utter ignorance about things they haven't seen? What a valuable lesson for our modern age. I think it's important for us to realize that we have limited experiences and limited perspectives, which means we can all see the same thing and all have a different understanding and perspective about what we've seen. If, if you doubt me, how many of you have read the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're all looking at the same thing, but because of their different perspectives, their different experiences, they all report something that might be slightly different, unless you're John. John, you, you report something that's completely off the wall and different. That's why John's my favorite gospel writer. And we have to remember that with these limitations in perspective, often we get ourselves in trouble. The elephant represents many different things in life that we can't see. In life, the elephant could be truth, reality, God, anything. So that leads me to the, my question of the day. Now, this is going to be the audience participation portion of our program. So pay attention to the question. When you look at Jesus, what do you see? Anyone, when you look at Jesus, what do you see? I got all day. Well, not really, but I got all day. Acceptance. I like, in my mind, I think how precious and what we have. Welcoming all with open hands. I actually see arms that are willing to hug everyone. Arms that are willing to hug. Anybody else? You get bonus points, you know. They have extra snacks for you if you get these right. <laughs> I see mercy. Mercy. Compassion. Compassion. Well, that's, you're cheating because it's in the title of the sermon. <laughs> and Jackie said that's what we're talking about today. So that doesn't count. I'm sorry. No extra snack for you. Um, <laughs> no compassion for you. No. Um, so some people, they look at Jesus, they see the miracle worker. But then they wonder, if Jesus is a miracle worker, why haven't I experienced any miracles in my life? Others will look at Jesus, the teacher, and just take in his lessons and begin to learn because they just want more information and more information about Jesus. Some people look at Jesus and they see the best example of how to live, so they try to emulate his life. Others look at Jesus and see the Savior, one who is willing to give us eternal life. And others just look at him and see all of those things and so much more. 
So I think the more important question is not how, what do you see when you see Jesus? I think the more important question today is how does Jesus want us to see him? And these words from John this morning reveal to us exactly how Jesus wants us to see him. And it also gives us some insight into our response, what we're supposed to do once we've seen Jesus. And so the story begins with some Greeks. There's nothing really hidden here. It's literally people from Greece who happen to be in Jerusalem. They're not Jewish, but they've come to watch the Passover festivities. And they had heard about Jesus. Information about Jesus had made it to them. So now that they were in town, they didn't want to hear more about Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to meet Jesus. Maybe they even wanted to follow Jesus. Who knows? And so naturally, they find Philip and Andrew. I say naturally because Philip and Andrew's names are Greek. So they thought, well, they're Greek. We're Greek. Let's go meet them. And so they have an opportunity. Philip and Andrew introduce them to Jesus, and no longer are they going to hear about Jesus. They finally get to hear from Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, hello, my name is Jesus. Welcome to Jerusalem. No, he says, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What? We've come all this way from Greece, and you speak in riddles? The Son of Man has come to be glorified. What does that even mean? What does glorified mean? Well, you know, I live with a librarian, so I ask her, and she tells me to research it myself. <laughs> Simply put, glory means to see the true nature of something. So in this instance, it's to see the true nature of Jesus, what he is about, who he really is. In other words, in this instance, it's time for us to see the real Jesus. And then he seems to go off on a tangent, and he talks about uh, planting seeds. Pretty much he says, if you want more of a particular kind of plant, you need to plant that particular kind of seed. And then he gives an agriculture lesson um, about how seeds have to die in order for new life to be produced. Then he goes off on another tangent, and he talks about a man who, in order to love his life, must hate it first. It seems that Jesus is all over the map. I mean, what does this have anything to do with seeing Jesus? Well, this is kind of a long ramp up, a, a long setup. Now, for example, Jesus' phrase that those who love their life must hate it is just reminding us that a person who loves their life is a person who puts themselves at the center to the neglect of others, which is pretty much, you know, self-centered people. Okay, all of us. So he's just setting us up. He's talking about dying to bring forth life. He's talking about putting others before yourself. All of this setup is just designed to show us and to tell us who the real Jesus is. It's designed to, to show us the compassion of God. The Jesus that Jesus wants us to see is the Jesus that's willing to go to the cross to die in order that we might have eternal life, which is opposite of what the disciples were expecting. The Jesus that Jesus wants us to see is the one who's willing to put others first. So to understand his glory, to really see why Jesus came, we have to see it in his dying. In the cross, we see his glory. In his death, we find new life. And more importantly than that, in love, Jesus is revealing who God is. I mean, we, we have this theological understanding that, that Jesus is God and God is Jesus, but here um, we believe that when Jesus came to earth, Jesus is God with skin on. And so that when you would look at Jesus, you would see God. And it was a God of compassion, not of God of condemnation. It was a God with a heart of mercy and love, a God who would let you have extra snack while stuffing Easter eggs downstairs. So if this is how we're supposed to see Jesus, and if this is how we're supposed to, to um, experience God, then it stands to reason the next 
uh, logical step is that maybe this is how we're supposed to live and move and exist in this world. That in other words, when, when people see us, people would see Jesus. And we can do this when we, we do things like offer forgiveness to someone who has wronged us, when we share the burdens of others, when we offer compassion instead of condemnation. But the challenge is, like the disciples, we tend to struggle with the way we see Jesus. Now, I can understand why the, why the disciples would struggle with it, because the disciples were expecting a Messiah that was going to come in, overturn the Roman uh, hierarchy and empire, and establish Israel once again as the ruling um, body. But they experienced a the Jesus who sacrificed. But, but we have the whole story. I mean, we know. But we still have our particular way of seeing Jesus. And unfortunately, we tend to mold Jesus into our own image. We do this, or our version of Jesus likes the people we like and hates the people we hate. Our version of Jesus affirms our own ideologies and our own politics. In other words, our versions of Jesus have become idols. And it's time that we smash our idols of Jesus and live for the Jesus that's revealed in the New Testament. A Jesus who ate with sinners, a Jesus who loved those that the religious leaders said were unlovable, a Jesus who visited the prisoners, who fed the hungry, who clothed the naked. This real version of Jesus wants us con to consider how we can die to ourselves in order that others might find new life. This version of Jesus wants us to reveal to others the compassion of God. And we do this when we realize that there is a different way to live. We do this when we don't let fear have the last word. We do this when we see the image of God in the face of the other. We do this as we live maybe like St. Patrick. It's St. Patrick's Day, right? Because of John, I had to mention St. Patrick today. He challenged me to. What do you know about St. Patrick? Do you know he wasn't Irish? He didn't drink beer, and he did not chase out snakes. He was actually British. He was kidnapped by Irish pirates when he was 16, taken to Ireland where he was forced into labor as a shepherd for a druid priest. At the time, Ireland was not a Christian area. And actually, his name wasn't even Patrick until he was ordained. But that's beside the point. He escaped his enslavement. And he was about to board a ship to go back to Britain when he heard the voice of God that said, stay. And he incarnated Jesus to the Irish. He adopted some of the Celtic Druish practices and Christianized them so that he could reach the people of Ireland so that they could come to know Jesus. He teaches us that seeing Jesus isn't a spectator sport. It's a way to be followed. It's a truth to be embodied. It's a life to be lived. It's about being that grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies so that it might bear much fruit. This is where we see Jesus in the letting go of ourselves, in the emptying of ourselves, in our leaving our old ways of life so that we can live a new way for Jesus. So what are we waiting for? I mean, better yet, who are we waiting for? You see, if we wait for the Jesus of the Gospels, we find a new way of living emerges. A life where we're not expected to live in perfection, we're expected to live in faith. A life where we are not to live for ourselves, instead we're expected to live for God. And I really believe the request of the Greeks is critical for the time in which we find ourselves. Because what I find so fascinating is when the Greeks went to visit Andrew and Philip, they didn't ask them to prove Jesus. They didn't ask for an argument about Jesus. They didn't ask for an apologetic about Jesus. They just wanted to see Jesus for themselves. 
And Philip and Andrew knew what that meant. They understood that seeing Jesus was really an invitation to relationship. It was an invitation to abide with Jesus. You see, I think what's so, so much what's wrong of religion and Christianity today is people are looking for an experience of Jesus. They're looking to see Jesus, but what we tend to offer them is information about Jesus. We try to prove or justify or validate the presence of God rather than just embodying the presence of God. Or they see us talk about love but live lives of hatred. Others will see God in us when we demonstrate the compassion of God. And, and that word compassion literally means to suffer together, to share someone else's suffering. Compassion requires us to open ourselves up, to feel the pain, the sorrow, the injustice being experienced by others. It requires us to hold the pain of others without trying to fix or solve or rescue them, just to sit with them. In 1985, a 49-year-old by the name of Bridget Gurney was walking home from her dentist in New York City when something tragic took place. One of the cranes on top of a skyscraper fell. It fell stories to the ground and it landed on her and pinned her legs underneath the steel of the crane. Miraculously, she lived. When the crane fell on her, she was pinned to the street for six hours. While rescue workers and emergency personnel tried to extricate her from other, out from under the steel without removing her legs. At the time, one of the emergency workers, Paul Ragonese, arrived on the scene. He saw everybody kind of doing their job, and then he saw that she was unable to move. So what did he do? He sat on the ground next to her, and he held her hand for six hours. Eventually, they were able to get the crane off of her. They rushed her to the hospital, rushed her into surgery, and after about a two-month stay in the hospital, she walked out on her own power, on her own two legs. And she was interviewed by a local news station, and they asked her, would, she, would you tell us what made the difference in your surviving this kind of ordeal? And her answer was simple. She pointed to Paul, and she said, what kept me alive was that he held my hand. The compassion of a stranger to hold another stranger's hand for six hours in the direst of circumstances remind us how powerful it is when we show someone that we care. We can tell people we care, but there's power when we show them we care. When the Greeks saw Jesus, they found someone who cared, who in fact pointed them to a God who cares. That's our calling. We're called to point others to a God who cares. Let us pray. Lord, we know that Easter is coming soon. And while we anxiously wait to celebrate your triumphant victory over sin and death, there are still difficult days between now and then. And try as we might, we cannot comprehend love and mercy so great as this. There's nothing perfect about us, yet you beckon us with hands that soon will be scarred by betrayal, greed, selfishness, pettiness, pride, and apathy. You see us in our imperfections with compassionate and patient eyes as we struggle to rid our lives of all the worldly things that distort, distract, and entangle us. As the cross looms ahead, our eyes and our focus are on you and you alone for our redemption and salvation. Amen.